microphone check. If you could let me know in the chat if you can hear me properly. Recording in progress. Microphone check. Okay, looks like that's where I can. Thank you very much. Okay, we're in a we're in a webinar mode, so you're here a bit early. I I really appreciate that. Um, what you know is what we're going to be doing today is mostly going to be for your experience. So I'm going to be giving you theory, but the important thing is to really feel it. So we'll wait for some more people to be creeping in here. Let me have a video check real quick as well. Um, start a video. And the video is showing up now there as well. And let us see if the webcam and screen is working. Okay, everything seems to be working fine. Zoom is finicky. We gotta, we gotta make sure that we do the checks as we get started. Welcome people. Um, welcome, we will be getting started soon. It's really good to see you. And what we're gonna be doing today is experiential. All right, so if, if you can get yourself into a calm state, into a relaxed state, and start paying attention to your breathing right now, I'm going to give you a lot of theory and, you know, peer-reviewed science about why this works. But the important thing is that you can feel it, okay? So if you can start relaxing yourself and just paying attention to the breathing, we're going to start off with exercises, okay? Let me close this off. And I think out of respect for everyone who shows up on time, we're just gonna we're gonna begin on time. Okay, so right now you can see webcam and screen. Webcam, I, I'm trying to do this across multiple screens here. Um, so yeah, you have access to the chat, and what we're gonna be doing as well is multiple polls. Okay, so as we are going through the training, I'm going to be asking you polls, and I do require that uh, level of feedback as well, if you could give that to me, so that um, I can know where everyone's at. Pop out the chat, there we go, I can pop out the chat, and now I can see what everyone's talking about. There's a Q&A section as well, questions are going to be at the end, okay folks, and I'm not going to keep you here the whole hour, most likely, we're, the plan isn't to keep you strung along for an hour, it's to get you feeling it, it's to get you understanding the theory of it, um, and then we'll have a questions at the end, okay? But there is a Q&A box and there is a chat in case you want to ask anything. So let us begin. Good. Got a camera screen. Okay, so today what we're going to be doing, let's start off with the poll, actually. I have a poll for you. And as I said, we're going to be, I'm going to need everyone interacting with them. I want to find out what everyone wants the most. These are anonymous, by the way, so other people won't see the results. Um, if you could tell me what you're looking for with whole body breathing, and I can guide the class more towards that direction. Okay. So the poll is going to be on your screen right now, and you can uh, you can vote, and you can vote for multiple options as well. What we're going to be doing is, at the very least, getting you the feeling of your craniofacial bones moving and flexing. And a lot of you are going to be getting pops and adjustments as well. And you're going to feel not just whether you're underdeveloped, but why, like what's actually going on inside of you, what's up with your structure, and it's going to help you get correction. And um, it's a good thing I asked because it, it seems like it's so evenly spaced what everyone wants. You know, a lot of you are here for sleep apnea better breathing, there's mental and emotional improvement. We're not gonna go so deep into that this training, but that's gonna be tomorrow and the days after. Orthodontics, TMJ and jaw pain, we're seeing good results with that in people and also in um, sleep apnea results. Uh, metaphysical reasons, we'll get into that at the end. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll end the poll there. Um, if you did not participate, that's a 65% participation rate. I really do appreciate it if you answer the polls because it lets me know where you guys are at. I really. I really, really do want you to be able to feel this. I'm really excited about what we've achieved in terms of getting people able to adjust their bones themselves. And uh, I want you to be able to feel that. So let's end the poll right there. I'll share, oh no, we'll just skip, we'll skip ahead. So right now, let's have you calm down. 
I'll calm down too. It's necessary as a teacher to be calm. This is not an exercise. What we are doing is understanding the way that the entire body connects together. So here's a quote from the Hopkins Institute. And again, we try to stay as adjacent and close to peer reviewed science as we can to like respected sources. And we make our inferences and experiences from there. So fascia is a thin casing of connective tissue that surrounds and holds every organ, blood vessel, bone, nerve fiber, and muscle in place. The tissue does more than provide internal structure. Fascia has nerves that make it almost as sensitive as skin. This is running through your whole body. The picture on the right is missing a head, but the fascia is in the head as well. Um, but that's essentially a dissection of the fascia out of the body. That is your body structure. And it has nerves that make it almost as sensitive as skin. When stressed, according to Hopkins, when stressed, it tightens up. And that's really important for us. So this is your internal structure of the body, and you don't feel it most of the time. What we're going to do now is get you into a calm state, into a breathing exercise, such that you can feel the fascia running through your entire body and into your head. And then we're going to get into the theory later. What I want you to do is I'm going to teach you this and then remain relaxed and calm and keep doing this for the entirety of the lecture. Take in the theory that I teach you, but don't get your mind too much into the theory. Just take it in passively, think about it, but continue practicing through the lecture. What we want is by the end of this, you feel the whole breathing through the body and you get your cranial sacral bones moving, okay? So, in a relaxed state, take notice of your breath, the physical sensations. It goes in through your nose, through your airway, and it fills your chest, your lungs. Pay attention to the physical sensations. On every single inhale, your chest expands. Feel the resistance to expansion. I want you to notice physically what's actually going on. On every inhale, what are the physical structures doing here? What does it feel like? Where is the breath in your chest? What area expands the most? Now what we're gonna do is take your hands and rest them gently on your knees. Continue breathing. Now. Turn your hands, palm up, and rest them back on your knees. And notice where the breathing moves to, where the physical expansion happens. With your palms up, your breathing should move. Not should, it will will move further up in your chest. So your upper chest is gonna feel more. Now to contrast that, flip your palms down and put them on your knees. And you're gonna feel that your lower belly, your diaphragm, that starts expanding more. I want you to flip back and forth and notice that when your palms are up, your upper chest is more expansion. And then when your palms are down, it's more in your diaphragm area, your belly.
Now, what I want you to do, once you get a feel for that, is contract your fists in anger, really actually contract them hard and then try to breathe in. Can you breathe in as much? Keep them held and keep them held and breathe in for a couple of breaths. Notice, are you breathing properly? Can you expand? Does your chest expand fully? And now on the next breath, relax your hands and breathe in. Is there a difference? I want you to let me know in the chat if there was a discernible difference. I'll throw up a poll to ask everyone if they're feeling it. Yeah, it's more hard to breathe with the hands closed. What, what we're trying to experience and understand, the science and the understanding tells us that this fascial network goes through the whole body. And Hopkins says when it's stressed, it tightens up. So you want to be able to experience that physically, that this, this is a whole body connection, that all the way into your hands, if you change your position and contraction, you can affect how this entire cavity expands or not. Excellent. This is an awareness exercise. So that's important to say that you're not trying to stop the breath. You're not visualizing that it stops. You're seeing physically what's actually going on in your body. Okay. I'll run a poll right now real quick just to see where we're at. And there's going to be another exercise as we go, but I want you to continue doing this, okay? Um, whether you got it really well or it, whether you got it just kind of, keep practicing with it. Flip your palms up and down. Clench and see, can you notice the, the fascial tissue running through everything that's actually preventing full expansion? Um, let's launch that pull. We'll move into the theory at this point as well. I love, it's beautiful because everyone can feel it a little bit, at least. I mean, it's 93% yes, everyone can feel it. 6% of you a little bit, which is very honest, which is what I need. Um, I want to explain to you that this isn't me preaching at you. This is me exploring this with you. And as I've been exploring with people, we're getting cranial adjustments. So it's very exciting. Um, everyone can feel it, which is amazing. Uh, it's not amazing. I mean, that's literally always how it's been um, because this connection does exist. Um, so every almost every, basically every single person is able to feel it. So continue practicing with that. That's going to be crucial to getting your cranial bones adjusted. Because now you can imagine, right? If your hand contracting or expanding, if that has a tug all the way down into the thorax, well, then there's also a reciprocal tug the other way. And there's also a reciprocal tug up to here. And uh, we are going to, Sean Smith says that it's, well, I shouldn't say names. Someone says, it's easier to see the connection if you contract one hand into a fist, release, and then contract the other. I haven't tried that, but thank you for sharing that. Um, we're building this forward as a community. I'll end the poll there, uh, overwhelmingly positive results. So here's the screen again. Keep practicing, please. Um, this, is, this is something you're going to cultivate and develop over time. Um, so as you know, an infant starts out with more skull bones than an adult. As you grow older, the skull bones kind of start melding together. And where they melt together is these locations that are called the sutures. Um, the sutures have fontanelles and cartilage between them. And this is meant so that when you're going through the birth canal, the skull can compress slightly and get out. And these are growth sites. So from childhood to adulthood, your, your skull expands. And not only at the sutures, but also at something important called a synchrondrosis, which is in your cranial base. There's multiple synchrondrosis, but in your cranial base, that's an important one. 
Um, I think a lot of people in this community have heard of the sutures because that's what everyone says the growth should happen at. Um, but when you go even deeper into the cranial base, which is where we need to be with the breathing uh, to actually get changes, um, that's something we're going to explore. What happens if the growth doesn't happen properly at the sutures? We have a term for that. The medical term for that is cranial synostosis. It's really obvious in a baby because a baby's head expands so much from birth into the coming months and into adulthood that if something fuses really early, it becomes a very obvious asymmetry. Cranial synostosis does not have a recognized medical cause. It just happens sometimes. By the way, the stream seems, seems blurry and low res. You guys let me know um, if, uh, if the stream quality is okay, okay? So if this happens in a baby, you end up with a face and a skull that's asymmetrical. Looking at these faces here, I don't think they're too, too far off from the face that you might see in an adult sometimes. So it's really obvious in a baby when a craniosynostosis happens, the sutures, which are supposed to have space between them, they're supposed to serve as growth sites. And for as of yet under, not understood medical reasons, they close together, they jam together. And when they jam together, they can't expand any further. So you get an asymmetry in the skull. What if this happens later in the growth? It won't be as obvious. Say you're seven, eight, nine, 13, 14, 15, 17, 18, and you're still supposed to have expansion left in your skull, but one of those 22 skull bones that you have, they jam up. And that's essentially the crux of our theory. We're saying that it's not that you're un it's not that you are downward grown. It's not like a melted face. That's not the issue. The issue is that you're supposed to be more grown. You're supposed to have more expansion. The sutures and the synchondrosis, they fuse too early. And that manifests as when you are in the suture area, that manifests as like an obvious asymmetry or lack of growth in many ways. And in the synchondrosis, as we'll explain, that makes your cranial base not long enough, which makes your maxilla not develop farther forward enough. Okay. So don't worry too much about the words, um, just have a look at the pictures. Yeah. So nothing, I'll, I'll be explaining everything. So there's nothing on the screen that you'll miss if you can't read the words. Um, let us do another poll here. Um, I want to ask, about yourself, like what's your symmetry like? For virtually everyone, there is a natural level of asymmetry that happens in the body. When you look at more non-industrial cultures, the amount of asymmetry is far lower. So that works into our theory as well, that this is a, this is a modern issue of craniosynostosis occurring in childhood, in teen years, and in development. And we want to, now that we can feel the breathing through the body, we want to use the breathing to kind of ply the sutures and everything back open and pop everything back open, to get back to proper growth. Okay. We got some Picassos in here. Okay. And an important thing to note, as well is that a lot of people are here for beauty and that sort of understanding. We're gonna look at beauty. Well, let me run the poll first. So what is beauty an indicator of? Again, this is, this is not me preaching at you. This is me sharing these ideas. And when everything fits in together well, that is, uh, that is when I think a theory really works. And I think everything fits into this theory really well. So as you know, Beauty is an indicator of health, okay? Seeing somebody with an asymmetric face or cranial synostosis or some issue like that is an indicator of a potential health risk, a major health danger. Childbirth is usually when the face goes asymmetric. 
as you're coming out of the birth canal, your, your head twists up and compresses. And as it comes out, what used to happen, I was spending time in India talking to more traditional type of community folk, where you would have midwives and the grandmothers and the mothers, they would know intuitively the, body, the, the baby's head is a little bit misshapen. So they would just pull on the nose, sharpen the cheekbones, kind of get it back into shape. This was a natural knowledge. This isn't something you had to teach people. They just understood the baby came out. The head is still soft. It got a little bit malformed as it was coming out. So they would just fix it. And now this is a big industry, actually, in Hollywood. Um, they have craniosacral therapists look at their kids because they know these things. And um, so this was a knowledge that was sort of lost in, in the medical industry where they, the kid would come out and that would be it. You wouldn't try and sort of fix the trauma that it went through going through the birth canal. Um, and the reason that it's a major indicator of beauty symmetry is because the mortality rates for women um, during the birth process, but asymmetry indicates difficult birth that the baby didn't just kind of come out. It was a difficult process. So that's why symmetry is a major indicator of attractiveness because it's health. It's health and it's safety. And on top of that, as you develop further, say you came out perfectly fine and you got adjusted. It's also a measure of resilience. Some of you answered strength and resilience as well, which I really like, because you're not wrong. So of course, a body that's really well formed will be strong. And it's also a measure of resilience because as we're gonna discuss, when you are stressed, your fascia contracts, your structure itself contracts. When you have a trauma, it could be a physical trauma, it could be a mental, emotional, all those traumas, you physically constrict. If you have a skull that is like that of a child or that of a baby still developing, you have these soft spots and they should be expanding away from each other with every inhale. Instead, you contract, they jam up against each other, and you end up with a craniosynchondrosis, that you're not getting the expansion and the growth that you should. Okay. So let's talk about the cranial base. Um, the important thing to note, we're going to skip most of the polls, because I think we're doing fine. well. Um, somebody who I, I know is from the general region, well, actually, I, I won't, I, I'm going to miss the chat for now. Let's sit down on top of it. Continue breathing. Gently flex and feel what's going on. Good. What a lot of correction methods try to do is just work on the nasal maxilla and they hit limits really quickly. Usually this remodel the alveolar ridge is all they're doing really. The reason is because the, the foundation of the house is what's incorrect. That's where we have to start fixing things. And this is something dentistry uh, and science, medical science already understands. So this isn't super new. A large part of the reason that they say the maxilla is not far forward enough is because the cranial base, which it hangs off of, is not far forward developed enough. If you can see down in this next picture on the left, that is your cranial base up top. If that is not long enough, What's your maxilla going to develop onto? So those are four bones. You have the, the occipital, basis of your sphenoid, presphenoid, ethmoid, and the frontal. So this chain right here. When you are a baby, it's still cartilage. It's a growth site. And I've seen a study that as old as 25, they can still see people that have these growth sites open. This is largely what's going to determine how far, far forward your, your face has grown. Now, how to get a suture back open. The way that we do that, according to the science, is cyclical motion. Okay. What most appliances and attempt, like, uh, say, reverse pull headgear, most attempts, they just have a static force. And that does produce a limited amount of results and pretty much none in adults. Because the way that circummaxillary sutures and all of these structures are supposed to open is through cyclical force. Speaking esoterically, that's literally how everything works. Everything works in cycles, the body, the breathing, 
everything is in a rhythmic cycle. So the sutures are supposed to come apart and contract cyclically. And that's what induces growth, according to studies. Now, in sutures that are say fused, if you're over the age of 25, reintroducing that growth is likely, this is where we infer, is likely a matter of reintroducing that cyclical pulling. So if you have a piece of cardboard and you try to tear it apart, or any you know material and try to tear it apart, the best way to do that is to kind of flex it first, get it weak in the middle, and then it'll start coming apart. So if you have a sphenobasilar junction that is now late, it's getting fused, the best way to pop everything back open is to start flexing it again. And not only physically, but there's also growth hormone signaling. In your ethmoid, this area that we're talking about, that's where your uh, pituitary glands are. That's like the master hormone gland. So the, the bones themselves will release like piezoelectric and other signaling methods saying like, we're back in that growth mode. And that's the theory. Important to note as well, as we said, um, somebody said this only works on under 25s. We are essentially trying to get it to work for everyone at every age. Um, that's the crux of the theory. Where we're at, at any age, we can get you to start adjusting your cranial bones at any age. What's important to note is that the nasal maxillary complex, again, it doesn't grow downwards. That's, downwards is not improper growth. The actual growth pattern of the nasal maxillary complex is down and forwards. As it grows down and forwards, it rotates counterclockwise. So what looks like a downward grown nasal maxillary area is just one that didn't grow enough. The reasons that it didn't grow enough are because the this cranial base is not far forward developed enough and because the rhythmic motion, the rhythmic tug that needs to happen here was not happening. It, it got stopped at some point. If we have a look, this is being recorded, by the way. So like if, if you're concerned about not being able to read something, you'll get a recording of this. If we have a look at how the face actually develops, pretty much all of the development is happening in this lower third area. This is gonna be important to note because this lower third area is what gets repeatedly tugged, rhythmically pulled on by the accessory muscles of breathing. So as we've seen with the hands, I want you to continue practicing that the fascial connections through your chest into your hands has an effect on how much the thorax expands. You also have all of the fascial muscles connecting up onto your cranium. And every time you breathe in, they're tugging as well. This happens automatically. It is happening right now, in fact. You're just unconscious of it because you're unconscious to the breathing typically, right? You can tune into the breathing and become conscious of the breathing. And as you become more and more conscious of it, you start to see, oh, there's a tug. Every single time I breathe, it tugs and it pulls open the cranial bones. Now, inside of the cranial bones, this is a lot of theory. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite well researched. Um, inside of the cranium, a, a big reason people don't get results after the age of 25, um, they don't get results, say, from the M M MSC or something like that. It expands quite a bit, and then it goes asymmetric is because inside of the skull, behind the, zy the zygoma, behind um, your sphenoid, you have something called the meninges, which is a very tough sheath of fascia. It's very, very tough. It's the, called the dura mater, the tough mother. This holds the structure of the skull. This is what cranial psychotherapists and cranial osteopaths work with largely as well. If this does not expand and allow movement, then your facial bones and your skull bones aren't going to go anywhere. There's, there's no way to say, say you have a reverse pull headgear on your maxilla and your tentorium. So this membrane here is tight. Your maxilla and your sphenoid, they're not going to go anywhere. They're held together on the inside by 
this meninges. So if we actually want to expand the skull, we have to get to a deeper level, which we do through the breathing, of feeling the meninges on the inside and feeling where they're tight. And what will often happen is you'll feel that they're tight, tighter on one side than the other, and they're usually going to be tighter on the side that you're asymmetric and less developed. Importantly as well, we have the craniosacral fluid, which when you breathe in, there's a research study on this, I'll show you in a bit, that when you breathe in, the pressure, the increase in craniosacral pressure also pushes out on all of the skull bones. Rahul, we will get to that at the end. There'll be a Q and A at the end, okay? So the breathing motion of the skull is something that's inherent in the shape of the bones. So cranial osteopathy and these, these courses, the, this field of study essentially began from someone noticing that the temporal bone itself is designed to move. So going through the halls of the school of osteopathy, he became aware of a mounted disarticulated skull. He stopped and studied the specimen. Suddenly there came a thought. I call it a guiding thought. Beveled like the gills of a fish, indicating articular mobility for a respiratory mechanism. Let me show you a video of what your cranial bones actually look like. I think most people think that the cranial bones all stick together like this, that they don't have, that they don't have overlap. But there's a cranial bone, the temporal bone, which overlaps massively the other bones. And it overlaps in such a way, as you can see here, these ridges indicate that the movement pattern of this temporal bone is to glide against the other skull bones and to open on the inhale. Okay. So let's have a look at what this video looks like what the temporal bone looks like on your skull. So that's the skull from the front. And this is the cranial base. This is what we're talking about that if you actually want cranial facial changes, this is what the entire nasal maxilla hangs off of. So your nasal maxilla is not gonna get changes until you get changes at the back here. Taking off the frontal bone, so that's this bone here. You can now see these are the bones at the side of your head. So the temporal, this is this side of the head. And this is the parietal, which is the top of your head. Look how much the overlap is. See how much they overlap. And that's the movement, essentially. It allows for the movement. The way the skull is set up, is in order to allow for that level of movement. And here's a, a visualization of what typically the breathing moment, movement would look like. On an inhale, you get the sort of flexing. Again, this is theory that I'm saying to you, but I want you to be able to experience it. The same way that you probably didn't notice earlier that if you change your hand position or the tightness of your hands, that it affects how much your chest can expand. That goes to this extremity as well. So there's a tightness in your head that is pulling open the cranial bones, but if that's too tight, then it, it jams them together and you get basically an undergrown skull. And if we start working, if we start noticing that connection, we can start opening up the skull again. So here's more of the scientifically backed evidence, like where the inferences come from. Because what you have here are the gill slits of an embryo of a fish. Like this is what basically all animal embryos look like in development. And the things that would become your gills, which are your breathing mechanisms as a fish, those become your jaws as a human. The nervous system that's running through those, the, the nervous system that is running the, 
breathing for a fish is also running the jaws and this whole complex here. So evolutionarily speaking and embryologically speaking, the breathing isn't just in the lungs and chest. And like evolutionarily speaking, all of these have been breathing organs and breathing anatomy. And they still serve that role. And we're trying to remember and wake up that role. They're serving it right now, even if you don't notice. But when, when they're working properly, that's when they tug down on the skull properly and pull the skull open. Good. And this was the research paper I was talking about earlier where they did determine that when you inhale, you have a cranial sacral fluid which runs from your sacrum up your spine and it fills your head. And when you inhale, the pressure in your head increases, which pushes all of your skull bones out. So it's an internal and external pressure. Every time you inhale, this fascial network pulls your head open from the outside and the increase in pressure from the inside of your skull pushes your skull bones apart. When that is disrupted through a trauma or some sort of issue like that, like uh, injury, you, you go into a compensated breathing pattern and you're no longer getting that expansive force, which is why the skull doesn't expand to its fully grown size. Um, this is a side note, but like the lymphatic system, the vagus nerve, the hormone glands, they're all soothed and work with the breathing as well. Okay, so as we've seen now that embryologically, evolutionarily speaking, you have a breathing mechanism through your whole body. Scientifically speaking and experientially, this is understood as well. These are accessory muscles of breathing. So we know that when you do a sprint or you, you run really, you know, you get really tired, all of these muscles activate to open up the chest. Your chest muscles, your scalenes, all everything up your neck, this all really activates at that time. It's very noticeable. It's very noticeable when you're really gassed and you really are pulling in for that oxygen. What we propose is that this is actually active all of the time. Every single breath that you take, all of these muscles are supposed to be inhaling. And when they inhale properly, they pull down on this part of the skull. The part of the skull that actually develops, because this is where all those muscles attach to. And it pulls your skull down and it, it opens up everything into development. As you start getting a feeling for these muscles, that is when you are going to be able to feel the skull bones flex and move. I want to put up another poll now. I'll launch it in a second. First, let's, we, we've probably been listening to the theory and involved in it. Go back only to the feeling of your breathing. Close your eyes because what we're trying to do is tap into the sensory information. As we've understood, the fascia is sensitive. It runs through your whole body, skull to your toes, and it's sensitive, just as sensitive as skin. You can feel it, but you're unconscious of it. So when you close your eyes, you're processing less sensory information. You can tune into the sensory information of your breath. Tune into the sensory information in your chest, the fascia and the structure of your chest. And feel how it all expands when you breathe in. Your chest expands on the inhale. Now, when you clench your fists, you have less expansion. Your shoulders are involved, keep the fist clenched. Notice that your shoulders move side to side. Your shoulders move away from each other when you inhale. If you have a feeling for your pelvic floor, if you clench that, 
like a mula bandha on the inhale. Then feel the contraction in the breath. Relax your pelvic floor. Relax the mula bandha so that you can breathe more. Relax your hands. And now you can breathe far more fully, far more normally. When you get angry, you subconsciously clench your hands. When you get scared, friend, you subconsciously flex your pelvic floor. And you hold on to these patterns through your life. You don't notice that you're still holding on to them. As a baby, something could happen. You, you clenched your pelvic floor. And it never unclenched. We we're not taking the full breath. So feeling the clenching, you can feel it into your feet as well. That's a little bit more advanced, but if you have the feeling all the way down to the soles of your feet, you clench your feet. And notice that you're restricting your breathing with this. Somewhat like a tube of toothpaste, if we constrict the breathing at the bottom, you can push the expansion of the fascia up into the head. Don't push hard, don't breathe hard, regular breathing. And feel the head ballooning slightly on every inhale. To get a better feel for it, what you can also do is you can clench your abs. Pull your abs in. I want you to breathe softly and gently. We're not trying to push blood into the head. We're not, we're not trying to increase the blood pressure in the head. But we're trying to notice what the scientific studies say that the, the fluid pressure in the cranial sacral fluid, CSF, that in the head increases and on the outsides of your skull, the fascial connections up into your head, they pull and tug on your skull and they flex the bones. If you can feel your shoulders going up or down side to side, feel the connection from your shoulders up the sides of your head to the sides of your neck. Sorry, up the sides of your neck to the sides of your head. Sides and back of your head. What's important to know is that you don't have to pull hard. Fascia is tensile tissue, meaning that it resists tension. It essentially, if you tug on it a little bit, it doesn't stretch. It holds shape. So when you breathe in and you start noticing the sides of your neck, the connection from your shoulders to the sides of your head. Essentially, your entire rib cage is holding onto the bottom and back of your head. So as your rib cage expands, that travels up the fascia connections, up the sides and back of your neck, and flexes your skull bones. Some of you may only feel tingling. You might only faintly feel it. What we don't want to do is imagine, okay? Don't imagine you're feeling anything. You have to actually be able to tune in and, and determine what you're feeling. In the same way that when your hand falls asleep, when it starts coming back, the nervous feeling starts coming back, it starts with tingles. And then eventually you can feel your hand fully again. In the same way, you have all of this sensory information 
this sensitivity in these muscles and in these skull bones that you've been unconscious of for most of your life. So as it wakes up, it's going to feel faint. It's going to feel kind of tingly. Practice until it definitively feels that this is this muscle. It attaches to this skull bone and I can feel what's going on, not theoretically, not as a visualization, not imagination. This is what is physically happening. In the same way that when I, when you clench your hand and you can physically feel, I can't breathe as much. You wanna make the physical link up into your skull bones. You have a look at me. You can keep your eyes closed if you're really getting it. But if you have a look at me to help you out a bit, all of this musculature of your neck attaches up into the, your head like so. Okay. Your entire rib cage widens and lifts on the inhale. When a muscle contracts, you can feel it at both ends contracting. Say this is your muscle. If it pulls here, that means you can also feel the pull on the other end. So when you breathe in, all of these muscles are playing a role in lifting up your rib cage and opening your rib cage. You can see the SEM activate on the inhale. And so as it activates, Feel where it connects into behind your ears. And a lot of you might feel it under the jaw as well. I feel it pulling open. I'm going to throw up a poll to see what percentage of people are finding what we're, just, we're describing right now. If you could come back, if you're really feeling it, I, I encourage you to just continue and listen to what I'm saying. Let's hear. Who, who can feel their skull bones flexing and moving? And I will put this, I'll put this live on the screen so that you can see the results. Okay. Here we go. Sixty-five percent participation rate. Everyone can feel it, kind of. The ones who can feel it, kind of. You, we have two more days of practice, okay? Where I'm going to be showing you techniques to tune into it even further. Okay, there's certain muscles like the SCMs, certain spinal mastoids. There's there's certain muscles that you can really tune into to really pick up how much you can feel it. Those who can feel it, yes. Please keep practicing. We're going to keep teaching you how to get it more and more, such that eventually. A lot of you already are getting pops and cracks and adjustments, but that's the goal for everyone, okay? You should be able to start getting adjustments in your, in your bones. Um, and for those of you who can't feel it, it's likely a proprioception thing, okay? So as, as you practice more, it could be getting to a point of stillness, which is why it's really important to have like a stillness in your body and mind. It's in that awareness. This is an awareness exercise. So every time you breathe in, this is happening because that's how the fascia works. It connects up into the head. So if you get a tug and a pull anywhere, it will transmit by its very nature. Um, that's how most of the muscles work. It's noticing and tuning into that, okay? And, and we're gonna continue to work to get that 21% that to a lower percentage, okay? Everyone should be able to feel it flex and move, feel it pop, okay? Physically, not imagining. That's the important part. Don't imagine anything. Okay. Run that there. And now here's the point of, okay, how we can feel the, the expansion. And I think you intuitively, a lot of you might understand um, that popping open the skull bones like this this is, a, I've essentially given you the understanding to start, right? Like you can get all the way, but now let's go into the more theoretical stuff. And if you can't feel the breathing, understanding the theory more will likely help. Um, 
one thing that's important to note is that this isn't a hundred percent original ideas, which is good, right? A lot of the stuff that I think of, or we as a community think of, and then we go online or into the more esoteric practices and see, has anyone noticed this before? And it's great because other people have noticed this. Um, so what you have on the left is a diagram from the Postural Restoration Institute. They recognize the same type of breathing chain that we do, that you have one diaphragm here and another diaphragm in the head. Um, and the way that you can look at it, the, the three main diaphragms that matter the most are gonna be your pelvic, your main breathing diaphragm, and your head diaphragm. If you want a reminder of what that head diaphragm is, we're gonna go deeper into it tomorrow. Um, but it is this tentorium, cerebella and your palate. So this structure here, okay? All of that needs to expand on the inhale. And when you have diaphragms that aren't expanding, your body's not opening up fully. And that's how you end up with likely an undergrown skull because you have a, a diaphragm running across your thorax that lets you inhale. And if you don't, if that diaphragm doesn't open fully, your ribs don't open fully, you don't get a full inhale. In the same way, if this diaphragm doesn't open fully, your, your skull is stuck, contracted tight and get a feeling for how it opens more, how we open up the skull. Now, diving deeper into the fascia and the more esoteric part of this, this is a video by Thomas Myers. He's gonna explain what tensegrity is. So why, when you breathe and you have tightness in one part of the body, why is it necessary that it affects other parts? And these are, you know, advanced fascial scientists and practitioners who in theory agree with what we say. Okay, so their understanding of how the fascia connects to each other, like other parts of the body, how the fascial trains run through the body, um, that is what we're working off of in order to establish our theory and our practice that the fascial chains that connect from your chest and your shoulders and everything up into the skull, those are effective in pulling open the skull. Well, first, you know, the tensegrity structure, it was my great good fortune to work and study with Buckner Sikora uh, early in my life as well. I just think about it with him. And he was a fellow who developed the genomics, and uh, it's not for an artist, but he's always making these kinds of structures. What I'd like you to notice about this is that the uh, vowels, which is the bone in the middle, are floating in space, and they are held in space by the balance of the elastic. The muscles in the fascia, the myofascia, doing an analogy to the body. So these structures, we're not used to looking at structures like this, similar to a balloon, maybe. Um, but otherwise, we're used to structures that are continuous compression like powder. So we structure our body as if it were a continuous compression structure. Too. You think the head sits on the neck, and the head and the neck sits on the torso, and that it's like a stack of bricks all over the neck. So we have the bone. The bone floats inside the body. When we start seeing the body, you can see all the power from the skin to how the problem is that the skin is founded in part. The problem in this side of the neck is down at the bottom of the leaf tape on the other side because we start seeing how the interrelationships of things are working in the body. So, I do often used to say that you can do the same. Um, this type of thing gives you a model where you can see, oh, if this goes over here, because the whole structure is in this, and then it's not very far away. And looking uh, for a way of balance, so we could say, okay, you know, this kind of problem is going to be So that's an understanding of how the fascia works in the body. Um, we are close to the one hour mark. It won't be too much longer and then we'll get into Q&A, okay? So if you see on the left, there's a picture of what the fascia looks like inside your body. It's, this is actually tensile. I know it looks like, you know, you pull it a little bit further and it'll just all come apart. It's actually strong tensile tissue. It runs through your whole body and it runs in every single direction, kind of like the background looks like. This, this feeling through your body is what you felt with the breathing of the hands and with the breathing into the skull now. For adjustment. 
What's important to note is that your, your central nervous system, so your brain, also runs all the way through this fascia, okay? When somebody breaks your heart, do you get a headache? Sometimes. What actually happens? Where do you feel the pain? Where do you feel grief? If you're nervous about something, where do you feel it? You feel it down the front of your body. Your central nervous system, so your emotions, your feelings, they run through the whole body. It's a psychosomatic, the mind and body are one. You know this. If you're scared about something, you feel it in your body. Every single emotion you feel, you feel down the front of your body. Okay? And as we've seen from the Hopkins Institute, when there is stress on the fascia, the fascia contracts. So if you have a lot of traumatic stress down the front of your body, it's going to collapse your structure. Okay? The way a tensegrity structure works, as you've seen, is that there's, doubt, there's essentially rigid parts and soft parts, rigid and taut, and it's, they essentially all pull each other open and pull each other closed. So if any part of your structure starts collapsing like the front does, that's gonna, you're going to see that as a structural collapse, like your facial collapse, the skull bones collapsing, the breathing itself collapses. And that's what an undergrown skull looks like. That's what joint pain, like from over compression or overly compressed discs uh, looks like. Um, because you have the feeling down the front of your body. Let me share you, with you what the aha moment was for me. Um, it was actually listening to uh, a lecture that I'm about to share with you, which is why this, this is definitely an older understanding. I feel very confident about it because we're pulling from things that are thousands of years old in many ways. So let me put this for you as well. Chronic habitual sense of muscular strength, which we were taught in the whole process of doing spontaneous things to order. When you're taking off in a jet plane and the thing has gone rather further down the runway than you think it should have without getting up in the air, you start pulling at your seatbelt to get this thing off the ground. Perfectly useful. So, in the same way, when our community tells us, look carefully, now listen, pay attention, we start using muscular strains around our eyes, ears, nose, hands, to try to use our muscles to make our nerves work. And in fact, it gets in the way of the function of the body. Try to function. And then when we try to control our emotions, we hold our breaths, pull our stomachs in, or tighten our rectal muscles. To hold ourselves together. Now pull yourself together. But immediately, what are you going to do? What does a child understand by that? He does it muscularly, pulls himself together. It's just useless. So everybody chronically pulls themselves together. So that it's so funny, if you get a person to just lie on the floor and relax, there's the floor on you as firm as can be holding them up. Nevertheless, you will detect that the person is making all sorts of tensions, lest he should suddenly turn into a nasty jello on the floor. <laughs> so that chronic tension, which in Sanskrit is called sankocha, which means contraction, is the root of what we call the feeling of the ego. So that in other words, this feeling of tightness is the physical reference for the psychological image of ourselves. So when really ancient knowledge and modern science come together, it's, it's always fascinating. When you have an emotional contraction in your body, it manifests as a physical contraction through your fascial chains. You have a back fascial chain, which through the tensegrity structure of your body, it opens up, it, it essentially extends your spine on the inhale. If you've done yoga, inhale is always extension. So on the inhale, you extend 
and lengthen. And this is supposed to open up your, the front of your body. This is your visceral cranium and you have your viscera down the front. And this is supposed to all in a tensegrity way, open up and get pulled away from the neurocranium and develop the skull and develop everything forward. When, the, when your traumas build up, when those sort of things build up in the body, you end up contracting downwards and this, this natural breathing motion, which is what drives the proper growth, proper unfolding of the body, that breaks down and your structure breaks down. So it can either be that the frontal chains are too strong, they've overpowered the back chain, or the back chain just got too weak. And that's what we work on fixing. Pulling your nasal maxilla away from your neurocranium, the whole thing pops open, and that's what proper growth is. We're almost uh, there. We're almost at the top of the hour. We'll be doing Q&A very soon. Within our theory, you have determined that there's a main chain of respiration. So your, your back extends, and this hall opens. and not only what we've identified, but the Postural Restoration Institute. Um, if you can see this picture here, this chain down the middle um, is what in, a, in an anatomy, in a dissection, they cut the cadaver open and they can see that there's a continuous connection all the way from the toes up through the psoas, uh, quadratus lumborum, your diaphragm, and then up into neck muscles and your tongue. Now this is this is one of the chains that we work with and we feel running through the body in order to get the body all expanding and opening. And essentially that's the crux of our theory. Um, we expand these, these diaphragms, we open up the front of the body and that's what proper development looks like. It's a psychosomatic approach. What you will notice as you practice this is that a lot of the places that you're stuck, so you can, you can feel the motion and the breathing and you can feel that it's not, it's not happening evenly. A lot of you did answer through food that you're asymmetric. So you're likely gonna feel on one side of your heart, one side of your chest, one side of your belly. When you breathe in, you're not expanding evenly. You're expanding asymmetrically. What's going on there? If you tune into that part of your body and breathe into it, you'll likely feel emotions that are stuck there, old traumas that are stuck there. And they and your fascial pattern, they release simultaneously. And this is something that um, people that work with the body have known for a long time. The patients always undergo it. So before our last slide, this is like, you know, where we get into the esoterica. Um, we're about to go into question and answer. So if, if you've heard anything like what I've talked about before, let me know, ask questions about it. Because the, the, the reason I'm really confident in presenting these theories and these ideas to you is because everything seems to fit neatly within what I'm presenting. It's an amalgamation of everything. Um, and of course, our goal is full structural correction, and we're gonna we're gonna get the knowledge from everywhere we can to achieve that. Um, the sort of results we get so far is um, that people can feel the flexing of the skull bones; they can get the adjustment and popping of skull bones. We've had some TMJ relief. We've had some sleep apnea relief. We are essentially, re if you're a cranial osteopath or cranial psychotherapist, I hope I do hope to work with you on this call because. These people get it immediately. They get it really quickly. Um, I want to be able to train people to work on themselves in that way. And uh, we, we have a repeatable way of training you to do that. So the next steps, um, tomorrow is going to be more heavily oriented towards practice. So if you kind of got it today, or if you didn't get it today, we're going to get you feeling it tomorrow, OK? And if you did get the feeling really well today, Let's maybe get you to pops and cracks tomorrow, okay? And get, get adjustments happening. Uh, we say pops and cracks because that's what it sounds like and feels like, but they're adjustments. You know, we're not looking for TMJ. We're not looking for the eustachian tubes, okay? That's important. Like there's, there's obvious things that could be happening, but we're looking at pops and cracks happening in areas that they shouldn't typically be happening um, and in ways that they didn't happen before. And they feel like adjustments. You, you can feel in your head, uh, this is this temporal bone, and ah, it just kind of clicked into place. This it feels better. Um, so please practice; it's really important. Uh, you'll you're gonna get an email with our links to the social media groups, so you can talk to other people that are about this. The community is the best; like it's really really important. Okay, we have an amazing community. Please stay with it. Don't don't leave this webinar and just uh, engage with the community. Talk to other people. Find out what's working for them. And we're gonna we're developing this project together. We all want the same 
health outcomes, the long structural correction. We're gonna do it. I, trust me, we're gonna do it. Um, you'll get a replay in your email as well. You can book a call with me as well um, if you want to apply for the training, if you are ready for the training. Um, so I'll drop that in the chat if you if you want to uh, do that. Okay. Um, let's go over to QA. Yeah, there there will be recordings for the next two sessions, but there's something interesting that it makes sense, but we can't explain it. When you are here with us as a group, you can feel it better. When you're one-on-one -on -one with me, you can feel it better. There's something called mirror neurons, which is the closest thing I can get to an explanation about this. When by looking at somebody doing an action, your body just kind of picks up on it automatically. You learn how to do it. Um, there's something very interesting about doing these sort of things live that if you're trying to pick up a new pattern or trying to understand what's going on in your body, you pick it up a lot better live. I've had many cases where someone watches a live session and they get it, and then they watch the recording and they can't get it until they do another live session or they do a one-on-one -on -one with me. Eventually, this isn't to make you reliant. But the point is eventually you just start doing it yourself. But if you're still learning, I recommend you tune in live as often as possible. Um, so someone was talking about the 25-year-old thing. Normal growth essentially stops at 25, right? What happens in a lot of situations like growth appliances, um, which it's unfortunate, but let me speak freely, that people are still having normal growth and then you put an appliance in them or you teach them something and it's very hard to determine how much of the, the changes that they have is because of your intervention compared to just the fact that they're a growing child, okay? So 25 is the age past which if anything happens in the skull or the craniofacial complex, we can definitively say that's the cause because they're not growing anymore, okay? What we are trying to do is reintroduce growth. Um, from what we understand, so the sutures never, they shouldn't fuse entirely, okay? Um, what studies show is that alternative uh, rapid, like alternative expansion causes, so here's a result from the study, five weeks of alteremic, which means alternating expansion, uh, open the circummaxillary sutures significantly more than one week of RME. Uh, and here taken together, the present data suggests that high frequency cycles of either tension or compression induce modeling and growth change in the cranial sutures. These are studies that were done with devices that were kind of switched once every couple of days, every couple of hours at most. Whereas what we're doing is we're, we're applying that force dozens of times per hour. I was going to say per minute, but how many times do you breathe per minute? Every single time you breathe. If you're applying a compressive and tensile force, you are, by the way, right now, as you breathe, you're always applying that. That's what you should start noticing. Meditate on it, focus on that. Tune into the fact that you're always doing that and then see, oh, it's not as strong as it should be. So we're gonna strengthen that. We're gonna open it all up so that those forces, theoretically and according to the science, should induce bone growth and remodeling. Uh, we want to open up the craniosynchondrosis as well as the SBJ joint. That's going to be really important. Um, now, I didn't get into this, but the why this makes sense as a comprehensive solution is the best we can do right now is that your, pine, your pineal gland, your... Um, someone drop in the chat, please. What, what's that main gland that's here? that uh, is essentially the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, which is like the master gland of the hormones, um, that is located right here, the cella turcica. So the, I, understand, I understand the text may be blurry, but this is the cella turcica, which is your master hormone gland. And that's located right at the area where we're trying to get that flexion and movement with the breathing on every inhale. It's right here. That's where we're trying to get movement milking the glands, so to say. So inducing movement in the glands to release growth hormone, release those sort of grow growing indicators. 
I believe that the hormone, the hormonal glands expect and require the feeling of breathing. Um, I'll go off onto a little bit of a tangent here, if that's okay with everyone. Your hormonal glands are expecting this rhythmic movement so that they can release the proper growth factors. And restarting this motion, we hope restarts sort of releasing those sort of, this is speculation, speculatory. So for people over 25, this is like one of the most comprehensive ways of looking at getting the growth again. But everyone over 25, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can get the feeling of adjustment, okay? At the very least, you can start feeling these bones adjust and pop into place, which can have like symmetry effects, breathing effects, TMJ issues, things like that, work towards resolving those, those sort of adjustments, okay? Um, the tangent's only gonna go as far as the fact that, say your vagus nerve runs down here, and these are the accessory muscles of breathing, right? Your, your vagus nerve is sort of expecting an inhalation. And if these muscles lock up, your central nervous system thinks you're not breathing properly. And so, because you're not, so you're going into like a, a flight or fight state. Um, this breathing should relax you. You should start getting like more saliv salivation, things like that, move into a parasympathetic state. So the breathing properly with the whole body, relaxing the whole fascia of the body, you're moving into like a relaxed state. And that's the growth state, right? You need to be in that state to grow optimally. Yeah. So we will go over to the Q and A box. People are people are stuck on that twenty five. Uh, let's say like, why does growth stop at twenty five when it hasn't even completed yet? Because say in a craniosynchondrosis case, growth hasn't finished yet. The sutures are jammed up; they can't move. Your body is trying. And that's one of the main thrusts of our theory. Your body is continuously trying to go properly. It, it hasn't given up on what the structure is supposed to have is. There's situations within you that is preventing it from growing properly. We have to remove that situation and allow the growth to happen properly. So, you know, in a baby, they are still growing, but those bones jammed up together they're not capable of growing further because they, they require that space. They require that cyclic opening and movement. Okay? And this will happen into your uh, later years and teenage years, which is what most people have. They have cranial synchondrosis. Um, have you noticed people's, uh, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Have you noticed people's eyeglasses prescription change from doing this method? We've only run about now 80 people through the course so far. And that's not something I've paid attention to, but a lot of people in the community are talking about it, okay? Um, so that, that's something a lot of people in our community are, are already thinking about right away because it should change the sphenoid alignment, things like that, under eye support. Um, that's a big topic in our community. Um, okay, so Clement says that I only sense tension in the upper nose bridge. What you're likely sensing there is airway flow. Okay, so try to sense more in your chest first and feel it through your body and then start creeping up the sides of your neck to feel the sides of your head, okay? We wanna make sure you're not feeling the air flow through your nose. We, we wanna make sure that it's actually, it, it's possible that you are feeling expansion here, but make sure you're not feeling just the air, that you're actually feeling expansion. Um, Abraham, I won't say names, too late. Um, how frequently should we practice this breathing? Um, again, that this is not, well, you should practice this, let's say, to get into your subconscious. I think a lot of you know this. The best times to get into your subconscious mind are like early morning and then before you go to bed. Okay, so if, if you want to start training yourself really well, those are the best times to do this practice. Try and throw in another time in the middle of the day as well. Try to do it in those three times of the day. And again, this is something that you are doing all the time Every single time you breathe in, like this isn't me saying this, this is just how the body, I, th I think we've logically explained with the fascia that that's how the body works. Uh, the fascia runs through your whole body. And so when you breathe in, all of the fascia gets tugged on and pulled and you can feel that it gets tugged on and pulled. So tuning into that feeling as much as you can throughout the day, 
and then feeling that it does tug on and pull your cranial bones. Until the point, we want you to get to the point where you can feel individually the bones and then feel inside the skull. This is going to be a bit advanced if you just started, but the meninges that are inside the skull, that's to the point where we need to get. Um, that's what cranial osteopaths try to do when you're doing like an MSC or those sort of expansions. Um, they try to work with that so that if it's tight in one area, they can get it releasing so that you're, you're not expanding asymmetrically. And so you should be able to feel that tightness yourself. Okay. Um, someone asked if they can restore all their growth since they're 15. Again, I can't, when, when someone's young and they get results, I can't claim the results because they're still young and they're growing. But the people that are young and have been doing this, they are getting quite good looking. Um, I haven't seen any effects on chronic migraines. I, I invite you to notice this, right? Uh, please try it out. And um, you can ask me questions if you have any. Uh, if you have chronic migraines, I would love for this to help, but I can't claim that it does. Um, a lot of, so when you have a headache, your brain tissue itself does not have sensory nerves, right? So when something hurts in your head, you're feeling the meninges really is what you're feeling. Um, and, and that's essentially my proof of concept for why you can feel the meninges when I have students work inside their head and they can feel something inside their head. And it's like, what am I feeling? You, you can't really feel your brain. So you're, you must be feeling the meninges. And that's what you feel when you have a headache. Um, so to do this, if you can feel the breathing in the head, if you can get to that level and then start noticing what happens when you have a chronic migraine. That should put you on the path to seeing if it's tension in the meninges, tension in the head that's causing those migraines. Okay. Um, would there be a benefit to combining this with Devo's DNA and reverse pull headgear, things like that? Um, I have compared the results to Devo's DNA and things like that. Uh, we'll see how freely I speak on these public seminars, but a lot of appliances remodel the alveolar ridge and not a ton else. And they build themselves as expanding the maxilla and the mid face. Um, you might even be better off really getting good at the breathing because um, people have results um, in the testimonials. Uh, people have results where, you know, they have not breathed this well. They're using like nasal strips to breathe. Um, for me as well, I used to have both nostrils clogged all the time. Now my both nostrils are always open. Um, we have people that have gone from like nasal strips to they're breathing better than they did like when they were a teenager before they had braces. Um, so yes, this will complement any other methodology you're using. If you're, if you're trying to expand the skull in some other way, this will really complement it. Um, but I, I think this is actually really the proper path to go forward if you want full correction. Learn this all the way, okay? If, if nothing else, learn this all the way. Um, it's free here for you to learn. It's just your breathing. I'm, I, I'm not selling you an appliance or anything that I have. This is your own body. Uh, nothing in the training, not a single part of the training is go and buy this thing from me. This is you using your own body and how your own body works and noticing, oh, I see why it's stuck, why it's not fully expanded. Um, somebody practiced the breathing and they felt sleepy. We'll, we'll go about five to 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, feeling sleepy is totally normal, uh, during the breathing. Um, there's an energy work component to this as well, which we won't get in. How long should each breath and in the inhale be in seconds? That's getting very technical. That's getting overly technical with this. Okay you are not controlling your breath. You can eventually when you get good at this and you, and you wanna do some sort of exercises to like tug harder, things like that. Right now you're just noticing your breath. Okay. And there's things like the Buteco method and, and the general understanding that your breathing rate should be lower. And a large part of, a large part of the reason that people's breathing rates are really quick is because your fascia is all tight. You're in like this flight or flight mode. So you're breathing quickly to relax the body, relax the fascia totally. When you do that, you'll notice a change in your voice as well. 
because there's all this tightness and constriction around here. That's one of the biggest effects that have been noticed by people. Um, because you know, say you get nervous when you're running a webinar or something, you might get tight, right? And when you go back into that relaxed state, you relax your entire body and you, you notice those changes in your voice and in your breathing rate. And it just slows right down. Um, yeah, somebody asked if you can do it lying down. I encourage that. Because right now, when you when I'm sitting up, these muscles, we're gonna go more into this tomorrow as well. These are playing a posture role. Right, they're holding my head straight. And if you've lost the feeling for these muscles, which virtually most people have, if you lie down, then these muscles aren't doing posture anymore. They're relaxed. So when you breathe in, you you can really feel them because all you're feeling is the breathing. I'll say that again because I, I don't think it was the best explanation there. Usually these muscles, when you're sitting up, are doing a posture role we're trying to wake up in you the feeling that these are also playing a breathing role when they play the breathing role they open the skull so to feel that breathing role properly you turn off the posture role. you do that by lying down and just relaxing these muscles yeah for how many minutes should i practice it um hours Quite a fact, it's, it is ours. Um, we don't do diet. We don't really talk about diet in our practice or methods. Okay, what are my thoughts on diaphragmatic breathing? I've been practicing it for a while now, and I find it quite difficult to breathe through my chest and neck. So the reason diaphragmatic breathing became a thing was that when you are tense or genuinely holding a lot, you tend to start breathing from your upper chest. Okay. And diaphragmatic breathing was a way of teaching people that you're holding, you're, you're not breathing well, you're not breathing fully, start breathing more deeper into your belly so that the whole area is expanding. Because you understand that diaphragmatic breathing is a bit of a, is oxymoron the right term? Because like, your diaphragm is for breathing. So it's like breathing, breathing. Um, so now that you've tuned into diaphragmatic breathing and you can feel that you can shift in your body where you're really breathing from and open up certain areas more. You find it quite hard to breathe through the chest and the neck. Find the fascial constrictions in your chest and neck and try to push the breath into them and see if com anything comes up emotionally or it might just open up from the resultant massage of pushing into that area. By massage, I mean not with your hands. You have this internal pressure of the breath and you can push into that area and open things up. If, oh, when you do these exercises, should you do them with palms up? down or alternate? That's an amazing question. I, I love people answering, asking questions like that because that's very on point. Um, I, I think if you, if you ask a question like that, that means you can, um, you should try it and tell me. Yeah, there, there's no right way to, this is noticing your breath, right? This is just, this is getting your breath and fixing your structure back to the point where it's supposed to be. Um, we're not, we're not trying to introduce some new method to fix your body. We're saying that your body already knows what it should be doing, but things have gone wrong. Traumas, those sort of issues, and that's collapsed the structure. So as you gain awareness of the structure, palms up, palms down, you'll understand what to do intuitively. Um, I'm not going to go too far up the chat, um, in order to respond to anything. And I think we'll, we'll close it off there. Tomorrow, what we're gonna be doing is so the SENs, if, if you really wanna get into the feeling of the flexion of the, uh, the bones, as I've shown here, the tugging that opens up your skull, that creates an adult skull, this, this is why a downgrown face, quote unquote, it's not downgrown, it's underground, <clears throat> why it looks like a child's face, right? It looks neotenous, neotenous is because it is. It didn't grow enough. That's why it looks more childlike. Whereas like a really masculine or really feminine 
fully grown, uh, quote unquote, beautiful face looks properly fully developed. So what we're going to tune in is the main breathing muscle uh, that pulls down on the temporal bones in the occiput, which is the SCM. We'll do that. We're going to open up to everything else. That'll be tomorrow. And I want you to notice as well, the sternocleidomastoid connects here into the back of the head. I, I could keep talking about this, and I do, in fact, keep talking about this, but we will cut this off soon. Um, it connects to the back of the head here. And at the back of the head, where it connects into, on the inside, is the diaphragm, that tentorium cerebelli, in much the same way that your psoas muscle, which we won't cover in this training, that I have to set a limit somewhere, but your psoas muscle connects into the back of your diaphragm as well, and is involved on the inhale. Like this is something that posture restoration people, this is body workers, they know this, that your, your psoas connects into your diaphragm and it's involved on the inhale. Um, and so in the same way, the SCM goes front to back and it connects to the back of this head diaphragm and it's involved in pulling everything open as you can see in this picture, uh, fifth picture over here. Okay. And we'll stop it right about there, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I'm going to drop a link to the one on one training once again in the chat in case you want to speak to me. And otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. Yeah, uh, someone said uh, forward head posture. A lot of people have had amazing uh, effects in terms of their posture improving with this. So that the link is in the chat. To book uh book an appointment with me if you want to discuss this further otherwise i'll see you in the class tomorrow we're going to get deeper into the breathing and everyone should be able to feel it deeply by the end of this three days and